All right, welcome everyone. Uh, Mari Mari, Ampuche, Kompu Penyi. Buenas tardes. And I'd actually love to uh, get started here. Um, thank you to Floyd and everybody at Cross Cultural Center and all our uh, co-sponsors and uh, co-leaders for this important conversation. Um, I'm actually wondering, Floyd, if we could go to a gallery view and see everybody for a moment, at least see our, our names and our black boxes for a moment. Um, my name is uh, Marcelo Garza Montalvo. Um, I use he, him, and they, them pronouns are good for me. Uh, I am an assistant professor of uh, ethnic studies here at uh, Cal State San Marcos. I'm very honored to be just beginning um, my position here in our small but fierce Department of Ethnic Studies program in Ethnic Studies. Thank you to everyone uh, for coming tonight and sharing this space uh, as part of our kickoff, as part of our warm up, as part of our hanging out together uh, to honor the legacy and the work of Cesar Chavez, Nikanka. Tomorrow is, of course, uh, the day of service itself, where we as uh, a Cal State San Marcos community will be um, getting our hands in the soil and working together to really um, build community and service. Uh, so I did want to just briefly uh, hand it over to Floyd, uh, if you could just share a little bit about what tomorrow is looking like and um, share a little bit about the day of service itself. So much, uh, Dr. Montalvo. Uh, so just by way of introduction, my name is Floyd Lai. Um, I use he, him pronouns. I'm director of the Cross-Cultural Center here at Cal State University, San Marcos. Um, I'm also currently interim director for the Gender Equity Center here as well. Um, tomorrow's an exciting day. Um, you know, the uh, Cesar Chavez Day of Service um, has been uh, on our campus uh, for um, almost 10 years, not quite. Next year will be our 10th year, but this is our ninth year. Um, and really it's an opportunity uh, for the, those in this area to be able to uh, get out into the community um, and to be able to work side by side as volunteers in the spirit of Cesar Chavez. And as we'll probably hear as well, uh, many, many others, right? Um, that are part of that legacy and the work that has been done. Um, we have about 200 or so volunteers um, that are gonna be signed up and we'll be going out uh, here uh, to uh, a couple of sites and agencies here in North County, San Diego. Um, there's always room for more. So if this is the first you're hearing about it, uh, feel free to come by um, and check in in the morning uh, here at Cal State San Marcos. We're working in collaboration uh, with folks over in Miracosta uh, College as well. And so it'll be a great effort um, uh, for all of us. And then we have some folks in our Temecula campus as well uh, uh, up uh, in that area. So uh, if you haven't heard about it, um, stick around, let me know. I'm happy to send you information about it. Uh, if you're hearing it for the first time, but would love to um, have you join us if you are able. And for those that have already signed up, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow and excited about tonight and the conversation that we'll have to kind of get us prepared uh, and put us in the frame of mind of what tomorrow really means for all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Floyd, uh, for your work and for all your uh, behind the scenes uh, solidarity and thanks to all the organizers to uh, there's an awesome beautiful community of uh, folks who have come together from across campus to really make this all happen so I just want to give thanks and acknowledge that whole circle um, and those uh, sponsors are listed on the website and uh, all the organizers have really put in all their little pieces to make uh, a really big day of surface happen so um, uh, we're honored to be a part of it. Uh, I want us to get started uh, with some acknowledgements. Uh, the first uh, acknowledgement is for here to acknowledge and give thanks and root us in the land. Um, we're here in Payam Kawachum territory, um, but I invite anybody in the chat uh, to share any other territories upon which uh, you find yourself, in which you live in relation to, um, any place names, if we know the indigenous place names and indigenous peoples 
uh, if we are not native to that place, it is important to acknowledge uh, this as um, an ongoing um, occupation of stolen land. So I'd like to begin with the words from our Luiseño Payam Kawuchum relatives and uh, colleagues in American Indian studies and students who developed our land acknowledgement for campus, which says, we acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Luiseño Payam Kawuchum people. Cal State San Marcos and its surrounding areas are still home to six federally, federally recognized tribes of La Jolla, Pala, Palma, Pechanga, Rincon, Sobaba, Luiseño, Payum Kawuchum people. It is also important to acknowledge that this land remains the shared space among the Cupeño and Kumiyai and Ipai peoples. So I would also be dropping in the chat the link to uh, the website that includes a really important video put together by our American Indian relatives, uh, students, staff, and faculty, uh, as well as links to some of the ways to support tribal sovereignty here uh, and move this land acknowledgement into action to work with our California native relatives. Um, I would also like to begin by, um, in the spirit of the United Farm Workers, um, acknowledging uh, the workers who are currently in the fields. I would like to begin by acknowledging um, and giving thanks for farm workers today uh, who are working. And if any of us ate food today, we would have to give thanks to a farm worker and to farmers. So I'd like us to begin by acknowledging the continued struggle in the fields for justice and all the work that they do and that labor that has been um, thoroughly uh, invisibilized and sometimes we might take for granted. But I wanna acknowledge my farm worker relatives uh, at the beginning of this conversation and hope that we hold them at the center of our hearts as we're having this discussion and find ways to take action that continues to advocate for justice in the fields. Uh, the last acknowledgement I'd like to um, ask for us to think about um, is just to acknowledge uh, the spirit of Cesar Chavez. And what I mean by that is him as an ancestor. And by way of acknowledging the presence of Cesar Chavez continuing to organize us from the other side, I want us to acknowledge all the ancestors that have uh, brought us together today. And I would like us to acknowledge the many other um, unnamed, maybe names we will never know of those ancestors who struggled for us to be here today and who also breathed life into our social movements and breathed life into the United Farm Workers in particular. That we understand today our conversation about the spirit of Cesar Chavez is with all due respect to him and all his relations, right? All his relatives that created a beautiful, powerful, strong social movement that we still look to uh, many years later um, and is a continuing um, union and struggle. So with that, uh, I just wanna um, uh, briefly introduce our uh, distinguished guests we have with us today. Um, again, my name is Mar Dr. Marcelo Garzo Montalvo. I'm an assistant professor of ethnic studies uh, here. I'm also a dancer and a musician, and uh, my work uh, focuses on uh, decolonization and cultural struggle here at Chicanex, Latinx, indigeneities, uh, reconnecting with our indigenous roots as displaced, detribalized indigenous peoples of the Americas. Um, and in that way, um, I'm honored to be in this uh, larger conversation about relational ethnic studies. How do we work and think with our Afro diasporic relatives, with our Asian and American and Asian diasporic relatives, American Indian indigenous peoples to these places, always in coalition, always in solidarity. That's, that's, what, that's how I was trained, how we do ethnic studies, and that's how I try to keep it. Um, and uh, to, by way of introduction, for our other uh, two distinguished guests today. Um, I wanna start by introducing uh, Vicki Wong. And I had all everything all lined up and now of course now it's gone. Here we go. 
Vicky Wong uh, grew up working in the fields of Salinas, California, the so-called salad bowl of the world. When she was 12, she applied to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Atlanta, Georgia, as she wanted to join the freedom fighters down south in their more militant civil rights struggle. They wrote back, no internet or social media back then, and told her she was too young, but sent her flyers and stickers to start what they called a baby or junior SNCC chapter in Salinas, which she did. Along with her co-onion uh, bunching worker friends, Lillian Favros Bando, she founded the Salinas chapter of the United Farm Workers Union. Throughout her junior high and high school years, she always uh, she also was also active in the anti-war and draft resistance movement, forming Salinas Vietnam Summer and campaigned for peace and freedom candidates, even though she was too young to vote. Excited by the 1964 free speech movement at UC Berkeley, uh, Vicky apl only applied there for college. It was lucky enough to get accepted on a partial scholarship and grants. One night in May 1968, her life in between the black and white world was liberated when she came, became part of one of the founding six of the Asian American Political Alliance in a small apartment in 2000, at 2005 Hearst Avenue, Berkeley, California. There's now a commemorative plaque there. Vicky then went on to co-found the first Asian American publication, the APA newsletter. Through APA, she co-founded the Third World Liberation Front that led to the Third World Strike at UC Berkeley for the entire winter quarter 1969, which established the Ethnic Studies Department, including Asian American Studies, the first ethnic studies program in the world. After college, Vicky lived in SF Chinatown, an organized garment, restaurant, clerical, electrical, and other workers and immigrants. She worked with Asian community senator and community senator, excuse me, uh, and International Hotel, a famous struggle of the I Hotel in Manila Town. She was elected manager of the Chinatown Co-op, the first garment workers uh, owned cooperative in the world, and was an editor and reporter for various publications, including the bilingual Wei Min Bao, Pacific Imperialism Notebook, and Pacific Basin Reports, which published uh, her booklet, The Global Struggle for Oil. Vicky was also co-authored What Have Women Done? Chinese Working People in Americas, The a Pictorial History, and Stand Up, an archive collection of the Bay Area Asian American Movement 1968 to 1974. I highly recommend checking out all of these publications. Uh, so let's give thanks and welcome Vicky. Thank you so much for joining us. OG, veterana, veteranex. And I'm also honored to uh, introduce Julio Somos Juan uh, Kanobi Magana, a master's in education, AKA Somos One, is a poet, rapper, co-founder of the Chicanx rap collective, Brown Buffalo. If you haven't checked out Brown Buffalo, check out their work. Lifelong middle school, high school educator and a cultural worker and a community builder. He is grandson and third son to original United Farm Workers strikers and organizers. Somos Juan Canobi comes from a long line of well-read mariachi singers and union trades people who used music to share unsung community stories and embolden their audience to believe in themselves and the power of community. So with that, can we please also give it up and give thanks and give Zoom claps and all the reactions to our uh, distinguished um, uh, guests here. Uh, so in that way, um, the first question, just to, to our, for our panelists to open up uh, the conversation is really, we're here, I want us to start with this question of um, what do we see, right, um, as uh, actually, a, Sorry, I totally just got my tabs uh, mixed up here. Here we go. Uh, so I just want you to actually share, uh, we heard a little bit of your background in the bio. If you just share a little bit of your background, your connections um, to the struggle in the fields, to the realities of the agricultural valleys of California. Um, and if we can start with you, uh, Vicky first, if you just wanna speak a little bit to some of the pieces you wanna hold up um, that uh, uh, from your, uh, over 50 years, 60 years of organizing in the fields. Um, if you could just share some of, what are some of the pieces you wanna share with folks today 
um, that you see are important lessons from those struggles. And I just asked you to uh, unmute uh, Vicky. I hope you can find the unmute so we can hear you. Can you hear us, Vicky? <laughs> See, that's why I'm an OG here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they call Salinas now the ag tech capital of. <laughs> You can see how I don't fit in there anymore either. I never fit in when I, I grew up and I was born there, I was raised there, and, and it was the salt marshes of the world. That's what Salinas means, and I found that out. <laughs> I spent most of my life there counting every day I could get the hell out of there. <laughs> Me, my best friends and I would meet in the cafeteria every day thinking, how many more days do we have to be here? <laughs> it was like hell on earth for us. And I understood why Steinbeck, you know, is that, that the great son of Salinas left Salinas and he never returned. He never returned. <laughs> I could not even read. This is the difference. I live now in Berkeley and I went to Berkeley. Berkeley is about the same population as Salinas. It's always been and it's still now. And yet, it's the exact opposite, the yin and yang. I mean, I could go for days, weeks in Salinas and see exactly the same people. <laughs> the same tired, retreaded ideas were out there. And it's in Berkeley, I can go every, every day, I see different people it's so diff and different nationalities and, and hear different languages being spoken. Because when I grew up in Salinas, there weren't that many uh, Chicanos or Latinos. It was mainly, uh, I grew up not even in Salinas, actually, I should correct that because they would not even want to claim me there. I grew up in El Asal which is outside of Salinas and it, they Salinas didn't want us. So we were an unincorporated area of Salinas. You know, there weren't any winning sidewalks and I had to take, I had to walk along uh, about a mile just to get to the bus stop to go to school, catch the bus to school. I mean, and it was the, the place where all most of the uh, depression era, uh, so-called Okies, you know, during the great depression, I uh, walked left and so there were a lot of poor whites there and I, I went to school and my brothers and I and my sisters and I went to school every day to the, the uh, Ching Chong Chinaman uh, chants of, of the stupid ignorant uh, whites who lived there and didn't know any better. And this was my world. I thought, man, I cannot live in this place. We could not even buy it. I didn't know who John Steinbeck was because his books were banned in Salinas at the time. This is how reactionary and conservative it was. And it's so such, you know, when I go back there now and I see John Steinbeck Library and Museum and John Steinbeck, you know, restaurant and every mortuary. I mean, he, he was forbidden. We couldn't read about him. It was such a reactionary town that the John Birch Society, which is the political wing, uh, the more uh, acceptable wing of the KKK, their library was right next to our main library. So I would pass there every day to go to our, our library. And this is, anyway, just to make, this, this is why, I mean, Salinas in itself was so dominated by the agriculture business. It was the military industrial complex that Eisenhower even talked about back then because Fort Ord at the time was very only about 20 minutes away in Seaside. And that was the largest ar army base in the country at the time. So we were dominated by the agribusiness and then by the military because that was the next big employer after, uh, are the corporate farmers. And then you had the healthcare industry, which was all tied in also to uh, the big agribusiness. So everything was controlled by them. It was uh, completely white dominated in, in every, you know, the top jobs, the top, um, anybody in gov city government and, and Salinas was the biggest city in, in Monterey County. So it was also uh, the county seat. 
And we had soldiers coming in every weekend from Fort Ord. And there's also the Department of Defense to this day still sends all their intelligence training officers. One of my best friend, Lillian, Bob Rose, her brother, Alex at the time, who was real gung-ho for the war. And uh, he signed up to uh, become an intelligence agent and they trained him to interrogate uh, prisoners caught during the Vietnam War, and he learned Japanese, Chinese, and Mandarin, um, Vietnamese, and he also his native Tagalog uh, there. And so we had the Department of Defense there. We had the Army base. We had uh, another Army base at Monterey. And uh, their presence was constantly about uh, throughout, you know, uh, growing up in Salinas, everything was, so many things were banned. And, and if you wrote anything in the paper in the Salinas, California, you had to print your name and address and phone number. So I wrote many letters and I got threatened all the time, but being young at the time, I wasn't really scared. <laughs> I didn't really understand what was, you know, what could happen to me at the time. But anyway, that, that was just kind of the life of growing up in, in a really reactionary town. And when later I wanted to understand the economics of imperialism and capitalism, I, I struggled through three volumes of Das Kapital by Marx. <laughs> and the one thing I did understand when I <laughs> struggling to stay asleep was rural idiocy. When he described rural idiocy, <laughs> That was Salinas. <laughs> I understood that what he meant because all those people who were romanticizing, especially that time during the hippie era and everything, you know, going, oh, the idyllic country life. And when you see it in the movies, but growing up in a, an idyllic country setting that, uh, well, I was it. I was in the, the salad boat of the world. I was in the world's capital of fresh produce and fruits. And it still is today. It's the world's capital of most of the food that you eat. And, and one time or another, as Marcelo was talking about, and this was not the romantic great life that they portray in the movies of the swooning heiresses and eating, drinking, you know, uh, lemonade and everything and having servants. We were the servants. We were the peasants. We were the ones picking those strawberries and breaking our backs so that you could have your daiquiris or whatever. And so most of the people, I, all the people I knew wanted to get the hell out of there. It was not something we wanted. I, I, I credit all those people who stayed and, and who did go back there to organize. But during that time, I was stuck there. So what could I do? All I could do was all I knew was I had to start changing things. I didn't think of it in terms of, oh, I got to make history or anything. I just thought, I can't live this way. I don't think other people can live this way. We've got to change it. And I'll, I'll just end it here in terms of, because I, I, I'm just going all over the place now because it brings back so many memories of growing up in the fields. I, my father had a small farm and we lost it very quickly because you know he couldn't compete with the big corporate farmers. So uh, I immediately, my brothers and I and sisters had to work for other, other farms, and I'd pick strawberries, tomatoes, cut lettuce, but I finally ended up mainly bunching green onions in the onion bunching sheds. But anyway, well, I, and hoeing weeds, that's the other thing that they, that more women do than the men is hoeing weeds. And so I was doing that in a field, and, and at that time, there were mainly, there was the Bracero program, which they brought uh, a lot of workers in from Mexico. And the farm workers at that time, there was no farm workers union in Salinas too, for some strange reason. And the, they didn't want, you know, at that time, say Chavez did not want to organize uh, what he called the wetbacks, you know, or the illegal aliens. And um, he saw them as a threat to jobs of citizens. And Yet I always had, you know, they tried to separate us from, but once you're in the fields, it's kind of hard to do that. I mean, they had captains around kind of patrolling us. But anyway, one day it was a really hard day because you had to bend your back down. The strawberries is, is the worst thing to pick because you had to bend down so low to pick them. And it must have shown because I was about like 
I don't know, 11 or 12 at the time. And one facility worker came up to me and he presented me with a bouquet of weeds. And I know some other people would think, oh, you know, is he trying to be fresh or whatever? Is this creepy? No, to me, it was the sweetest, sweetest gesture I'd ever had because he just wanted to bring some brightness to my life. And it was a very, you know, totally innocent and wonderful and beautiful moment. And I'll never forget. And I thought, I don't know, I thought of this when I saw Marcella's question about what does solidarity mean to you? And that kind of came to me because more than even like the angst and like it's behind me or the fighting and picket lines and, and all that, which you know I've done plenty of, the, the act of not just kindness, but okay, here's, the, here's a memorable quote from Steinbeck. He said, I've looked at many people, I think I said, I, I, I wonder how many people I've looked at uh, all my life and I've never seen them. And that's what I feel like we, we who start, we who call ourselves activists or give a voice to those that people look at all the time but never see the invisible people because that's how I felt for such a long time. And also not be, and being growing up into this black and white world of the in-betweens. And I think a lot of you understand that where you're not black and you're not white. And even though I was involved heavily in the movement for years, I never had a place. I was always either a white supporter or a black supporter. And so that's another thing when, when the whole Asian American, when I helped found the Asian American movement. You know, these, when, when you see something's wrong, when you see something's not right, something, you just can't wait. You can't wait for things to be corrected or, you know, I just had that impulse in me that I think is part of the legacy of, of Cesar Chavez that, you know, you don't wait, you can't wait for things to be righted. You have to start doing what you can. And to me, that getting that bouquet of weeds from the Brazil worker was a start in that because what was behind it was that spirit of solidarity of what a real civilized society should be like. And so I'm just gonna end that here right now because I'm going over tangents. I really wanna hear what everybody else has to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh... Vicky, um, always for your for your stories and sharing that. Um, and with that, yeah, I'd just like to invite uh, Somos if you'd like to share some of your reflections, just to start um, uh, sharing any of those uh, stories. You know, these narratives that are so important for us uh, to hear. So uh, please go ahead, Somos. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I wanted to say um, thank you to Vicky for everything. I'm sure everybody in this and that's here right now is feeling the same way, just feeling in awe and feeling grateful for um, all your work and your spirit. That's still, uh, still, you know, is relevant. Still works even through a screen. So I appreciate you. Um, I'm, I'm greeting you all from Carquin, uh, Carquinas Aloni Land, which is like north of Richmond, still in the Bay Area. Um, and uh, I wanted to thank Marcelo and thank. Uh, Floyd and everybody and all the organizers, all the all you young people out there that um, did a lot of the work to get this going. And also uh, to anybody that's in this room that's just part of this conversation, um, it means something to me just knowing uh, how precious time is, uh, you know, playing off. But um, I'm gonna call you Professor Wong. Shit, we should call you damn Madam. I don't know. I don't know what to call you, but I want to call you Professor. Uh, what you were just saying about time, you know. Um, it's so important that we uh, cherish these moments. So I appreciate you being here to cherish this with me. Uh, I, uh, my name is Julio Magaña Saludado. Uh, you know, folks in the in the rap world and like this art world that I'm part of, I'm blessed to be part of Circle Call Me uh, Somos or Somos One. Um, and I was born in Delano, California, but I would like to start uh, speaking on farm farm worker. This this question of uh, my 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 feelings about farm workers, I, I just wanted to share that my family um, on my mother's side is from Northern Jalisco, 
It's near Aguascalientes. And it's a small, uh, as, as Mar Dr. Marcelo just said, you know, a, a D, um, what, what was the word you use? Like a uh, de-indigenized uh, Indian population, right? So my mom's pueblo were uh, segregated from the white part of their town, which was called uh, Teocaltiche. So my mom's from this part out there, right? And my abuelito, who uh, is this triple OG in the farm worker movement, he um, was a young boy, um, Indio, born in Mexico, uh, actually born in Arizona, that's a different story. But um, but he's originally an indigenous, as our family's indigenous to Northern uh, Jalisco. And um, they've always loved working the land. And I know that the, the politics and everything and the disgusting structure that we live in, uh, it makes it so like almost unbearable to look at, you know, and it's hard to see, right? You drive down the five and you see the state in which people work. It's, it's, it's dehumanizing. It, it hurts to, to watch it, you know, but my, I wanted to say that um, I've always, I'm grateful that my abuelito always instilled in us um, a profound love for the earth and love for um, nurturing the land and cultivating the land, you know? So if you go to any of my mom's families and actually a lot of my dad's family too, but mostly my mom's family, like, everybody's house is just popping with flowers right now, you know, or popping with all these fruit trees in the backyard. So um, I grew up, uh, you know, a child of farm workers. My uh, abuelitos came to the United States. Um, my mother, uh, and they settled in Early Mart, California. I don't know if you guys know where Early Mart is, but it's north of Delano. So it's right in the, in, it's right in the, kind of the hub of the early organizing. Um, so that's where my abuelitos moved to. And, uh, as I said in, in the opening, right, or in my bio, um, they were also very literate and very uh, very wise on my on my mother's side, right? So in these indigenous people that learn how to read and write were taught by the by the Spanish Catholic priests way back in the day, um, were empowered and to learn how to protect themselves and defend themselves using legal methods, right? And learning like learning how to read contracts and learning how to defend your own constitutional rights. And this is how they held on to some land in Mexico. And then when they came to the United States and were in early Mart, um, they managed to purchase a house in early Mart. And so they were uh, also had a big family. So uh, seven, seven daughters and two sons. This is my mom's family. They were all farm workers from the time they were children too. Um, and so I think because of that, they were able to save money and get that house or, and, and start to get that house. But that house was the very first house meeting that the farm work, that the United Farm Workers hosted. So that became something if you like read about the the, the, the kind of strategy of, of uh, CESAD that he learned from like the, Calif the, the service organization, right? CSO was doing these house meetings. Um, and the first one they held was in early Mart in my abuelito's house. So they were farm workers uh, that knew better. And when they were treated terribly, they knew that they needed to organize. They, they had some experience. My abuelita actually had some experience in Arizona in a coal mine uh, strike back in the 50s, I believe it was, or, or late 40s. And so he had some or union organizing experience. And so when uh, uh, Cesar and Dolores were coming around and meeting uh, farm worker family leads, uh, they were told to, to talk to my abuelitos. And um, yeah, and so they were... Like I said, proud indigenous farm workers. Uh, they loved working the land, and uh, they loved people, though. And they were um, they were also mariachis in Mexico. So my abuelito was a trump trumpet player, and um, since he uh, was basically bullied out of continuing his education, uh, he and was was wasn't allowed to go to this white school that he received a scholarship for. Um, he knew that he had to work the land and so he learned how to work the land and he, you know his whole family knows how they have beautiful land out there in mexico but he also um did what he loved which was playing music and uh and he played the trumpet and so he instilled in his daughters and sons this love of music this love of telling stories through songs and making making people feel like you know, empowered, feeling alive. You know, you hear a beautiful song, you feel alive, you feel in touch with yourself, you feel in touch with the people that are enjoying it with you. And so he instilled that in his daughters. And so my mother was one of the um, original strikers who her and her, my tia Tonya, um, 
or some of the early strikers that became organizers who uh, then went on to places like Chicago and New York and stuff and, and sang songs uh, in those towns to kind of rally the troops. And so um, I come from this, this interesting blend of very proud, uh, you know, plant cultivators, um, harvest, you know, harvesters of the earth and uh, a love of people and community and bringing people together. They're very proud and faithful um, Catholics too, you know, very Guadalupano style. So, um, yeah, I come from that that background. So my my relationship with the farm work with farm work itself is through hearing those stories um, and through working the land with my abuelitos. You know, just working uh, out in our yards and just learning some of these uh, techniques and just how to keep the you know. So if you were to come up to my house right now, you would see this beautiful yard that's you know still carries that legacy of uh, of working the land. And then um, in terms of uh, yeah, uh, as a sophomore at UC Berkeley, so go Bears, <laughs> I guess we could say that now, even though I've like organized against the university so often uh, as well, go TWLF, because I was TWF 99. Um, so, uh, but you know, when I was a student at UC Berkeley, I spent every summer doing a different kind of, um, uh, I, I did this thing called Union Summer, which was through the AFL-CIO. And they trained young people to be union organizers, field organizers. And so I went through that, that training program uh, a couple of summers in a row. So I worked in Watsonville. So shout out to uh, Maria uh, out there in Watson. Um, I lived in Las Lomas and, uh, and, and, and worked out there with the farm working community out there. Um, and then, um, yeah, so I, I have some experience organizing in the fields. But, you know, uh, yeah, I'm just a proud descendant of, of uh land cultivators. So thank you for having me. I feel very honored to be here. Thank you for your attention. We're, uh, we're so honored to have both of you all here and everybody in this space, right, to have this, this conversation. And thank you for sharing your stories and, you know, uh, presenting your ancestors, your families, your lineages. Your st and, you know, um, those are all uh, just precious, you know, for us to, to learn uh, together. Um, I, and with that, I kind of want to just ask um, another question of you two and just for uh, the rest of folks here, um, I'm going to ask another question and then please think of and or if you'd like as we're going, you're more than welcome to ask your questions and actually very encouraged. The panelists both really want to hear from you all who are here, um, but we're here to have this hold this space. But if you want to put in the chat any questions you might have, um, please do not hesitate uh, to do that. Um, and we'll make sure to, uh, to get to those as much as we can. Um, so let's see if I can get us in a panel style so this will work. Ooh, look at my the Zoom skills. Let's see if they're working. Hey, okay, aquí estamos. Uh, so another question I have for us then is, um, I'll make it a, a two-parter because uh, Vicky already started getting there and I think in a, in a really beautiful way. So um, oh, I thank you. Cool, thank you. Uh, so what we're gonna ask. And then for oh, the moment, I went from the trails. I want. I'm gonna mute this. There's somebody here who's coming in with some sound. All right. Um, the next question that I have for folks is: uh, You already, Vicky, you were already starting to um, share uh, a really, I think, powerful and beautiful story of what solidarity looks like, right? So I wanna reiterate that question, like what is um, this question of the spirit of solidarity? What does that look like? And I wanna amend that with, amend that with what um, something that we've been in discussion with that uh, you also already mentioned, uh, Vicky, and that I'm glad that my students have brought into my class this semester, uh, which is for whatever reason this year, uh, this viral video of our ancestor Cesar Chavez, um, saying explicitly, right, that he does not want undocumented folks uh, in the union, that he um, is speaking powerful words that are understood as being actually against our undocumented relatives in many ways, and kind of further a, a criminalizing of, of our undocumented relatives. Um, it, is, it should be named that, that those statements were later, he later personally publicly retracted, but nonetheless, those words resonate, right, historically. So I wanna take them as an opportunity to ask the question, what does solidarity look like? But also what are, take it, that as an opportunity to think about what are the ways that 
what are, are, are the other lessons that we can learn from the legacy of Cesar Chavez in a way that um, don't, um, but in a way that also, what can we learn from a, in, in a more complex way, in a more uh, real way with the, the realities of the, the messiness of, of solidarity, right? Of building solidarity um, and, and organizing. So that's my, my question, like if we could just speak to this what does solidarity look like uh, in, in, all, in all its uh, capacities? Maybe we can start with you, Vicky, again. Thank you, dear. Yeah, I, I meant to say also, yeah, I meant how I um, how found that I, I was stunned that there was no farm workers union in chapter in Salinas. Uh, and I think they began in 62 uh, or so and in, in Delano, right? And I, cause I heard about it again, you know, you have to understand even without the internet, what we have now over cell phones. I mean, we were, we were like back in the stone age for most of you all <laughs> in terms of, we, we would rely on, on, you know, newspapers and I, you know, my parents hardly couldn't afford to buy anything. So we'd have to go to the library to see newspapers from a week ago, you know, because <laughs> the only thing we had was the local paper, which was, you know, pretty crappy. And we were one of the last to get a TV. So I, I just was glued to the, the news, you know, because that was like the only other thing I could hear about what was going on in the world. But believe me back then, I think even it's true at any period, when you really feel strongly about something and you really have to find out, you know, you know, you can't just be the only one uh, when you want to change something or you feel something is so rotten. You, you, you got to have, there's got to be some other, you know, some other person, some, something else happening. And because we, we couldn't have gotten to this point without the change and, and, and what little we even heard about history. Um, so you did find out eventually if there was any any new ideas, anything challenging, anything threatening. I mean, just like when I first heard the Beatles and that I, I think I wrote that in my thing about how I was off to the president of the Beatle Maniacs fan club and we were considered subversive because they were considered foreigners with long hair and, and hey, you know, you're supposed to like the good old, good old boys, like the beach boys, you know, who looked like they were going to golf lessons or something. <laughs> I mean, this was, you know, the good old white uh, music, Pat Boone doing Little Richard, you know, I mean, this kind of, and we said, hell no, <laughs> you know, as soon as we were at the beat, we knew that there was something fresh going on. So all the movement back then was the whole movement. So that's, that's what I, I do think is, you know, a good part of what uh, Chavez realized is that, you know, he, he did link up to the social movements that was happening at the time. And, and that was really a big step back then because you know the workers union as great as it was mainly st stayed in the workplace and what what happened with the you know farm workers and with was, was this whole by recognizing the dignity of the person the worker as a person and his whole life and then also what was you know with the also being you know uh, with the ethnic minority aspect of, of the workers you know we got like the connection to, no, it's not just something reduced to the workplace, it's your whole life style. We have to respect people as human beings, you know, and, and these are, and especially when you're coming to the, in some ways, the poorest of the poorest and the lowliest of the lowliest doing the work that nobody else wants to do, but everybody needs to eat, you know, to really put a spotlight on that. And so that whole, uh, I mean, I, I was very inspired by hearing about what, you know, the United Farm Workers were doing. And here I am in the, like the cell of all the world and there's not, so I, I contacted them again by slow mail and Dolores Huerta answered me back. And, and so we agreed to meet, but she said, we have to be careful. So we had to go do it secretly. We had to meet in the lobby uh, on the stairwell 
uh, of this, the only hotel in Salinas at that time because she didn't want any of the agribusiness to find out that she was in town and that we were meeting and forming a chapter. So it was very clandestine and, and very like, you know, I spy <laughs> And I'm like 11, 12 years old. I, I, I don't know what the hell. And also I was very hampered because my Spanish was, is, was and, and then and still is very poor. And most of the, the field workers you were Spanish, although they were you know, people do. Uh, I do want to get into that part. There were many Filipinos, yeah, Yemeni, India, and other black, poor white farm workers as well. But the majority were even back then, mainly, you know, uh, Hispanic, or, or mainly from Mexico at the time. And so it was very difficult for me and my and Lillian, who's Filipino, um, to go and talk to these people because, you know, our language thing. But still, that didn't deter us, you know, call us stupid or whatever. <laughs> but we just figured we gotta get, hey, we have to organize. I mean, it just makes sense that we've gotta do something, you know, because we can't go on living like this. I mean, we gotta do something. I mean, they understand that. And and so we just went ahead and, and tried to do the best we could. And But meanwhile, you know, this is not the only thing. We're doing all these other things. The, the, like I said, Ford Order was around. So we're doing anti-draft work. The Vietnam War was really, you know, getting, uh, you know, heavier. And so we were against that. And also I forgot to mention the other big power in the area was the uh, Soledad Prison. That was the other big employment center. So you had that which is also politically extremely conservative. And so most of the money it was going to either, you know, the agribusiness corporations, the um, prison system, and for the military, you know. <laughs> and so it, it was just this, this whole, the, everything you could think of the, of the worst, you know, the being in the belly of the beast. I felt like I was, you know, in the belly of the belly of the beast. And it was like, you know, it's something that we just were constantly getting um, every morning in this, I don't know, you still have this in school, in your high schools, but the homeroom class, the first class, the, the principal would come on, the bulletin going, and it has come to our attention that there were a couple of students walking around wearing buttons saying support the farm workers or boycott grapes. And everybody would turn and look at me and my friends because we were the ones doing this or walking around with uh, putting, you know, boycott grapes on their binders, you know, and telling and, and passing out signs in, this, in the cafeteria saying don't eat grapes. And then, Later, I find out, just to get more on the solidarity part of this, and this picture behind me, this is a picture of Filipino, the Filipino uh, labor union. They were the first to actually, uh, first ethnic minority to organize a, a farm workers union in this country in the 30s when farm workers were starting to get organized. And they organized a chapter uh, in Salinas in 1934 and went on strike several times in 1935 and 37. And there were hundreds, there were over, I think, 1,200 or 1,400 Filipino workers in this union. It was quite large. And they went on strike and, and they struck fear into the hearts of all corporate and, and businesses, even at the multinational business world, because they dared to actually ally themselves with the Mexican Workers Union that was also formed at that time, and but separate. So they had an alliance and later they were the ones who also um, compelled the United Farm Workers, well at that time I think it was called the National Farm Workers Union, to um, you know, join the grape strike because they were on strike first. And later, and also they got other, the, uh, it was actually the rank and file, it was my understanding and, and how it was at the time, who actually even pressured uh, Cesar Chavez to uh, join the, the great strike with the Filipino Workers Union because, I mean, the Filipino uh, Labor Union, because uh, they wanted to join with them. And so that was unheard of back then, you know? It, it's still even today <laughs> quite a, a big deal. But at, back then in the 30s, to have 
different ethnic minorities were striking against the, one of the most powerful industries in the world, in, in the heart of the uh, food empire. I mean, they did not talk and they did not take kindly to this. So of course, a group of vigilantes that was unsurprisingly organized and headed by the local sheriff of Salinas, uh, ran them out of town by at gunpoint. 800 of the of Filipinos were driven out of Salinas by gunpoint. Now, this is, a, this is something I had to learn later through, you know, establishing our, the World College is what, what, you know, what ethnic studies is supposed to be for is taking out the truth like this, because this was suppressed. I didn't know any of this when I'm growing up in Salinas, but I find out later, hey, there had been a farm workers union and they actually uh, won some concessions. You know, they they finally were driven out, and and the, due to the harassment and violence and and constant discrimination, most of, of the workers left the area. And the same thing happened with Chinese who used to actually own some of the best areas. Now that Clint Eastwood's, I think, uh, that the, the restaurant is on, and some other places, posh places, and the golf golfing courses, um, were mainly settled by. Asian, Japanese, and Chinese uh, fishermen. And Steinbeck wrote about all of this. Steinbeck tried to expose the corruption and all the, the class uh, domination and the white supremacy in Salinas. That's why he was banned. And to his credit, when the Jap the Salinas is also one of the main areas that, that lobbied against, uh, it, uh, lobbied for incarcerating Japanese during World War II for uh, World War II. And even after the war ended, it was Salinas who tried to uh, have a pass a law that Japanese couldn't return. And it was people like Steinbeck, actually, that's one of the brighter shining moments, again, of real solidarity, who said that, you know, that, that this is ridiculous and that we should allow the Japanese to come back after they we already had lost their land and their any possessions they left behind. And so, so every, there's a yin and yang here too, because with the oppression, there will always be resistance. And that's happened throughout history. And so again, this is this is why you know what behind me should live on, and it kind of came to the next generation because the other sign it shows us it's like the next generation. And this was I think a couple of years ago with uh, Filipinos support Black Lives Matter, and so that's pretty good solidarity right there. I, I'll, I'll, I'll end here and that us almost take over now. Uh, yeah, for real. Go ahead, Go ahead someone. Thank you, Vicky, for sharing that uh, story about the uh, organizing in Salinas, you know. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know that story. I, it's funny, I, I, I often tell this story of solidarity because um, I've been on and off the Cesar Chavez Speakers Bureau for whatever reason. So I get invited to speak places, you know, and so I'm like, I do some research and I tend to speak of like the Japanese Mexican Labor Alliance that, that happened in Oxnard in the thirties, you know, um, that might, that's a little bit more, uh, was more documented, I think, um, for some, whatever reason, but uh, yeah. So I just want to bring it all the way back. And I know that this may seem like some, uh, some mansplanation right here. Um, but I do want to say, uh, I want to put it out there, um, and, and I want to give thanks again uh, that I've been I've been learning all these different ways of um, taking care of myself and uh, and you know just living a, a fuller life. Uh, and I've been dealing with you know anxiety and depression my whole life, and so I've been practicing mindfulness. And and then it, ultimately I discover an organization that's looking for people with high school and middle school experience, teaching experience to teach mindfulness. So I ended up teaching mindfulness. And now I teach mindfulness to middle school students. Uh, and it's a wonderful experience, but all of this stuff taps into these these mindfulness precepts that were kind of established, let's get real, you know, by, by Indian and, uh, you know, um, Buddhist folks from way, way back, you know what I mean? Uh, but 
this concept of compassion is something that I, I literally explicitly teach uh, in the beginning of the year. Uh, I talk about solidarity as compassion. So I'm sorry, I, I think I skipped ahead. But, uh, and then when, when, I, when I describe what compassion is for these young people, um, it's, it's the difference that I make with, uh, with like sympathy right and, comp and compassion are two different things the way i teach it to these students right just to help it be very clear for the students and i'll tell them that sympathy is when you're you know you're walking along and you see somebody trip and they fall and you're like oh snap that that must have hurt you know and you're uh and you know you're kind of embarrassed for them or whatever but you just let them be right but but compassion is is when you feel for them and then you help them up right you're you're trying to ease the suffering of somebody else and uh, so this is how I approach um, this idea of solidarity, right? Is helping to, one, be in touch with ourselves so that we can feel this, you know, uh, our own pain and, and, and live our own lives and learn to be, to, to process what we're dealing with. But then to be able to feel that in somebody else, you know, um, is, is I think that, that the supreme, I don't know, you know, uh, to me, that's divinity. That's divine to me. You know what I mean? Is when you you care for somebody else, and I've always that's always blown me away that in my family I feel so blessed that my mother's family um, from a long time ago they they did things like selling tamales to raise money to like help other people, you know, and like they 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 ran these pools and stuff so they can help uh, you know support one another. And so for me, this idea that um, that life is not just about protecting yourself and your family, but but your neighbor too that their life is just as important as your own family's life. And I know that that's totally un-American, you know what I mean? Call me a communist, whatever. But I think it kind of comes back to that compassion, right? Just, and, uh, but I, I always like, like to just tell, remind students that that feeling that you have when you help somebody out though, you know, that, that's a, sad, a deeper satisfaction than you'll ever get from any kind of paycheck, you know? And I can tell all these folks that are in this room right now after my 43 years on this planet, uh, that that is, is what still fuels me, is that feeling of being helpful, of being, uh, helping to reduce the suffering of myself first and then others, you know? So um, I'm, I'm bringing it back, and I know, again, that might be like mansplaining a little bit, but um, but I also want to just share a couple stories because I think, uh, for sure, most definitely, thank you. Um, solidarity stories, okay, two of them, real cool ones. Try to keep them quick. My mom tells me the story um, that when she was, I believe, in Chicago, um, so my mom became a, a, a farm worker, uh, an organizer, right? And she was sent out on this school bus. They went out to the, the sit major cities and they dropped off farm workers to organize those cities. And my mom, you know, shows up in chanclas and her huaraches and her dress, you know, and, and it was like, had the guts to do it, you know, my, and my abuelito had the guts to send, allow them to go, you know, um, but they get there and, uh, the, one of the beautiful stories. They were organizing a picket line in front of like a, um, a, a grocery store trying to get people to stop to not buy grapes. And um, they're singing, uh, uh, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't remember if it was, uh, we shall not, we shall not be moved, right? Some some like classic six, I, I believe that was it. Uh, and, the, and the owner comes out and he's like, and my mom was like the point on this picket line, right? They, they, they Their job was to bring it to the public, like you said, Vicky, right? They were the internet. They were like, let's let's get this into the people's face, right? And so my mom takes some other farm workers and they're walking in, in circles in front of this like Safeway, you know, and we shall no, 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 small bit and singing it. Um, and then uh, the Safeway, the, 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 the manager comes out and he's like, I'm sorry, um, but you guys can't sing in front of my store. I need you guys to go. Uh, you're disrupting the business. So it's like, please stop singing. So then they start whistling. And they, and, uh, and, and the, eventually people start watching this and start joining in and start joining the picket line because they're like, what are these people talking about? And why are they even out here? You know, the guy comes out, he's like, hey, you guys, I just told you, please don't sing. And she's like, um, we weren't singing, we were whistling. And he's like, well, don't whistle either. And so they, so by that, and then, they like kind of regrouped. I'm like, what can we do with it? And my mom's like, I got an idea. So then they just started humming really loud. <laughs> and and it just won over, it touched the hearts of enough people that that picket line just blossomed. And they eventually, with the help of the 
uh, Black Panthers out there, that kind of Black Panther, or I believe it was like Black Knights or some other organization, different name, similar purpose, uh, joined them and they eventually cleared the, the city of Chicago of California table grapes, you know? Um, and so that was just one small example. There's another huge example in Oakland. Uh, this is before the grape strike or the grape boycott was even declared. So I want to I want to put this in perspective. People brought up the the um, you know Cesar being like anti-immigrant at that time, right? I, I, I'm going to put this in perspective that they were on strike from 1965 till 1970. That's five fucking years that they didn't have you know income. They didn't, and they were trying to hold this group together for five years. You know, with these farm workers out like living on donations, they got paid five bucks a week my mom and my tias, you know, to go organize. So they would eat one meal a day, you know, it's crazy. Like they, they just gave it all up to go help farm workers and spread that word. But they did that not just for farm workers either. They did that for all the workers that are invisible. Like we were talking about earlier, you know, um, for all invisible workers. And so, uh, but when they, after they went on strike and the word got to, the ILWU, which is the International Longshoremen and Workers Union, and uh, which is those folks that unpack giant crates on the side of boats, you know, like giant cargo ships, mostly black folks in Oakland. And uh, when the ILWU heard about the grape strike and they heard in solidarity, they organized like this midnight, really clandestine action where they went out and they dumped tons, like like containerfuls of grape grapes into the uh, San Francisco Bay. In solidarity, um, they called it the the Oakland Grape Party or something like that. Uh, but it was again did not really get enough documentation. You know, this is just one of those stories that exists within us. And like you know, in my mom telling of the story, I shared that with some dude at, at a Black Lives Matter uh, rally. You know, and brother in the ILWU jacket. You know, I'm like, hey, I got a story for you. And I told him the story, and he's like, turns around, he's an older guy. He's like, solidarity is the only way. That's what he said. That's the only way. Um, and so, you know, those are just a couple of stories of, of solidarity around the farm worker movement. But yeah, I wanted to bring it back to that compassion idea, just for us to remember, um, yeah, to take care of ourselves too. And in this movement, we got to be in it for the long haul, right? Right, Professor Wong? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Blesso Kamati. Uh, thank you so much for those stories and yes that live in the oral tradition right that are passed down in spaces like this and now we have zoom to uh, maybe amplify and uh, we this is also an appeal to our students to become ethnic studies majors to uh, get the tools to be able to do this uh, work that um, people like Vicky and people like Somos and others that I know here on the call have worked so that we have these tools to remember, right? Make sure we keep, we keep these, these stories alive and these memories. And uh, just to reflect back some things, you know, just um, hearing a lot of reminders of uh, another concept that has really helped ground and guide me, which is uh, what does it mean to be a good relative, right? What does it mean to understand ourselves as always in interconnection? As you're saying, I think so much, I really appreciate you um bringing up like solidarity is a spiritual uh, act right solidarity meaning let us act in a way and and comport and organize in a way that we do understand that we are interconnected right that this is there is um a sense of um of kinship right let's make kin in good ways uh through this work right and so that um of course we're always uh uh, this, this, let's just continue to expand and redefine what we understand as solidarity. I think I just really appreciate you all doing that for us. I'm going to drop actually a quick link in the chat that um, of some work that I'm that you all are also reminding me of. That is uh, especially for the educators in the room. Um, I've been privileged to work with a group for over 10 years now called Planting Justice, rooted in Ohlone land in Oakland, California, and we teach this a lot as well. Specifically the uh, crucial interconnection between the Black Panther Party for self-defense and the United Farm Worker Movement. Um, that is in the chat is a Padlet that's a open source um, 
lesson plan that we developed uh, to teach this uh, with, uh, especially with eight through 12th, it's really good with high school youth, um, but we could also use it in, in higher education. Uh, it's an important story to tell what it looks like. Um, and then we would do it in the garden. We'd plant plants together and we would say, look, see how plants work together. This is how root systems can not, they don't have to always compete, right? Corn, bean, squash, three sisters have always worked. Indigenous knowledge in the garden knows this. And then how we learn from those plants to organize in our communities, right? This is all our relatives, not just our human uh, relatives, our human and beyond human, right? That we're all related to these, to this web of relations and of beings. And I just wanna share one other reflection um, to be, uh, to, to answer my own question, okay? To be the profe right here. Is the, this is my grandma always used to do that. She would ask a question and then she'd be like, I'm glad you asked. Okay, so but here's my response to this question because I think my students uh, brought this up. We had a really rich conversation and this is the last piece I'll say before I really, I have another question, but really encourage um, uh, folks in the room to share. But um, where we ended up with this question of Cesar Chavez, I think, um, and, and this, the specific critiques that are just re-emerging in the more, they've always been there, um, but they're here now in a, with a lot more energy around like, oh, now do we, wh why should we even celebrate or honor Cesar Chavez, right? Was even some of these are coming in as are being raised, those questions are being raised. And for me, I'm not necessarily gonna be like, get into yes or no in that, those, those, those terms of debate, but more actually just wanna point to, this is the importance of how we do our movement history. How do we learn from the movements? And how do we also always resist and at least understand the damage that happens when we are always looking for the next charismatic, most of the time male, cis, straight man leader to lead us and kind of centralize and give us this focal point for us to like, okay, now we're just gonna learn about that. And this is with so much respect for Cesar Chavez that I say this, that and I think he himself would uh, acknowledge that he was a member of a social, she was an organizer in a social movement, right? And we need to be able, what, how, how can we historicize social movements in a more correct, uh, uh, real way, right? And I just wanna just uh, honor that. Uh, how do we honor the work and not overly romanticize, right? And I think that there's, that, that's, that's something that I've learned from people like Grace Lee Boggs, people like Angela Davis, others who are feminist philosophers and feminist activists, historians and thinkers that are always asking us to like, let's look at social movements uh, through that lens, particularly of what happens when we honor um, Ella Baker, right? How long did it, how many de decades did it take for Ella Baker's story to get kind of resurrected and put forward as, what does it mean when we celebrate the Ella Bakers? Meaning the person, you didn't know their name until a historian dug in and said, who was organizing, who was feeding folks, who was housing people, right? Who was getting childcare, who was getting translation, right? And so how do we take this spirit of solidarity of Cesar Chavez and do then decentralize, right? What we're honoring and on, and, and in turn, I would say honor ourselves, right? Honor that we are the leaders we've been, work, we've been waiting for. Let's stop waiting for the next charismatic male leader and as Vicky is asking us to be, be who do the do the work that we know needs to get done, right? There's and see the and honor the the stories that you all are sharing of if those folks have done it, like we we si se puede, right? In the words of Dolores Huerta, right? Uh, yeah, we, right? Si se puede salir adelante, right? We have to always have that that disciplinary uh, hope. Um, so in that way. Um, uh, I would like um, to open it up and actually I'm going to uh, unspotlight us and I encourage everybody to put on your, uh, what's the, let's see where we are, remove spotlight. Oh, I almost removed Vicky completely from the meeting. All right. Um, I encourage you to go to your gallery view and I also in this moment encourage folks to um, unmute your video if you'd like. Um, so we can see each other's faces and really open it up for our last uh, uh, moments together, last 20 minutes or so. Um, if there are any questions, comments, reflections, um, critiques, pushback, 
we're, we just, uh, we'd love to hear from other folks um, after Vicky and Somos and I have been going for a minute. So if anybody uh, has any questions, reflections, please, you can raise your hands uh, in the Zoom, Zoom hand or your, in the image if you have your camera on. Big shout out to the people putting the cameras on. <laughs> I know, right? It's, yeah. It goes a long way. Makes such a difference. Thank you. So yeah, any questions, reflections, comments? Latos. Now, I just want to uh, remind us all, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think partly why I'm, I'm so adamant about this, like, decentralizing of this, this the history or the history of the farm worker movement is because, not just because my mom was such a big part of it, or my tias or my abuelitos were, but because I think that it's, um, I think it, we're, we're we're missing such an opportunity to uh, to learn from our ancestors that did cross, you know, that that invisible cultural barrier to organize with other folks. I think that the uh, I've always had this this problem with this like iconization of Cesar Chavez, you know, because it's, it's like all the credit goes to one dude, right? As it always often does in movements. So um, I guess I think the what, the reason why I'm so passionate in it is partly because of all these people I know were behind it, you know. Uh, there's even this dude that just passed away, uh, Marcos Munoz, who was uh, one of the OGs um, in Delano and then went on to live in Chicago. Actually, him and my mom were, were homies in Chicago and, and stayed out there. Um, but he was such a monumental powerhouse in himself, you know. He did so much work not just in the farm worker movement, but then afterwards in his community, helping build schools and, you know, all the like. So I, I guess I just want to uh, remind us all to remember that every movement, I mean, just like the, just like the civil rights movement, right? We, we realized that there was countless people who, who contributed. Um, but I think that's what I would ask you guys to do is to ask those questions like, who, who were those names that, didn't, that, did, that don't get the shine? You know what I mean? Who, who was the person um, that, you know, organized this particular rally that we all know about, you know? Um, you know, one of the, one of the little things, uh, like small examples, like the, the, when the farm workers brought in the Virgen de Guadalupe into the movement in the fields in Delano, it was a huge boon to the movement. It like blew up the movement. Every, like a lot more people started going out there and feeling proud to be part of the movement when they saw that their culture was being reflected back to them, you know, and that, that their, their spirituality was going to be respected and honored and included in the movement. And that was my tia Amelia and my, and my, um, my abuelita, you know, and they were like, hey, we should do this. And if you go to the history books now, it's like that credit is sometimes in certain books given directly to Cesar, like it was his idea, you know what I mean? So I have the, that that chip on my shoulder perhaps you know but I'm, I'm just wondering like and all these other movements and just learning so much about vicky tonight i'm just like damn i want to learn so much more about you so uh just i hope that just what's you know your appetite to 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 ask more about those unsung leaders that that we don't hear about you know um and in which way you might like be that next person you know and I don't know. Um, I do this workshop with young people about the legacy of Cesar Chavez, and it's all about honoring somebody in their life that has left an indelible mark of inspiration on them, you know. And I believe, and I honor them as kind of carrying the legacy of Cesar Chavez, because a lot of, you know, the, 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 they represent for students somebody that knew shit was wrong and and organized to to challenge it, you know. And I think that that's the legacy that we're honoring tonight, right, is not necessarily him, but that spirit of resistance, that spirit of solidarity. Um, how do we, you know, strategically take power back, you know? So uh, anyway, just wanted to throw that out there. Gracias, Somos, for adding that. 
And while it's just, um, just another invitation for other questions, but I'll just offer that it, it seems really significant that you're talking about the, the simbolo de la Morenita, la Virgencita Guadalupe, and the power of that. Um, there's a lot of it brings up to me, but it just reminds me also that what we are doing is also protecting the earth, right? Like La Tona, you know, Guadalupe for me uh, represents the Madre Tierra, right? Uh, a way that the ancestors devised a way to continue to honor and, 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 and uh, protect Mother Earth, Tonantin Tlalico Atlique. And so when we bring that in, right? It's yes, we're struggling against the corporate agribusiness. Yes, we're struggling against todo esto. But what are we also all like? How can we frame it like our relatives and stand? Rock always said we're water protectors, right? Not protesters, right? In the in the news, it's always oh, there's the protesters, they're blocking the pipeline, yes, but we're also protecting, you know, dignity, human dignity, our relatives, the and the water. Yeah. Right. Questions at one point. I will be asking, no, I'll, I'll say that. Questions, comments, concerns, feedback. We'd love to hear from other voices. Oh, did I freeze and get off? You got a little bit. <laughs> yeah, um, I just wanted to share that. I mean, for me, I'm just so overwhelmed with all this information. It's so great to hear, you know, these stories. And I guess um, what I would kind of wonder is like, how, what's a good use of our time with Cesar Chavez Day being, you know, holiday and not having school? Um, you know, we're going to volunteer. There's a lot of volunteer opportunities. But um, after that, it sounds like, you know, things we could do are maybe like to learn about our history or, um, you know, like when we move forward, like what is a good way to celebrate, to use our time um, in a meaningful way, I guess. You wanna take that, Vicky? Or anybody else wanna respond? Cause I'm sure that some of you all have the answers to that question. Yeah, anybody else wonder? Well, I just say, start, start with where you are, you know, I mean, People say, oh, I'm not political, or I'm not, you know, a political scientist or anything like that. But yet, you don't know. Actually, it's kind of ironic. I grew up in Salinas, and, and the reason why it is such the world's bread bass, I mean, uh, food produce center, is because the soil is so nutrient rich. And yet, what I discovered in my journey has been that it's been covered we're, you might not be political scientists, but you know what we've all been? We've been political manure for what the corporate hybrid business power, white power structure has totally spread and fed our brains with. And that you now have the opportunity where you are specifically in school and this time of your life is the time, the best time to find out and discover things because you might not have the time, you know, later on when you're busy in your careers or working or something, but this is what we had, our future, again, I say we did not strike for an ethnic studies department. We struck for a third world college because we saw that, you know, we had to liberate education as well to, to liberate yourself, you have to liberate your mind, <laughs> what, what, what we've been polluted with. And so it's like all the stuff now, you know, it's like to get to dig for the truth. It, you have the capacity to do that where you are right now. You know, this, you have the best opportunity, the resources, the, the libraries, the archives, whatever, the information, the time. And, and I really encourage, I know it's hard, especially for people, you know, working, saving money for college or whatever, but, you know, to, to explore outside of your comfort zone, your, 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 you know, because when I went to Berkeley, man, I just like went wild. I just checked who are the best professors. I don't care what they were talking about. It, it was a zoology or, 
or whatever. If I heard that they were exciting professors, I wanted to go to that class. And I had had to duck my counselor every quarter about what my career path is because it changed every quarter. I don't know if you could get away with that now. But I, I changed my, my major every moment I could get to justify why I was taking so many weird courses, you know? Because it's the time in your life you to find out and explore things and, and do things, you know, that you normally wouldn't do. And that means also with the, the people that you associate with. And so whenever people say, well, what should I do you know, to, to start even getting involved? Even if you don't want to join an organization or organize or something, you know, you start with the way you live. You start with the way you interact with each other. You start that because we, the only way we can bring a new society in, a just and fair and decent society is if we start living that ourselves and try to the best of our ability to do that. So the compassion that Zomos is talking about to show that, to, to the, get to that point where it's not just yourself and your own family that you're concerned about. And, and that's the, the, the thing. I do criticize the movement because I've been part of it. We did not, we covered a lot of mistakes that we made. You know, we don't talk about some of the things that we regret. And don't tell me anybody who says they have no regrets, especially in or movement organizing. <laughs> yes, tune them out. <laughs> because we, you're going to make plenty of mistakes and you're going to have regrets if you even take a chance on anything. You're going to have regrets, but you can learn from them. And so we did not publicize a lot of stuff that we would regret that we did. I mean, there's reasons for it. I mean, you could, there was the Cointel, the FBI, you know, if you've seen that movie, Judas and the Black Messiah. I mean, you know, it was real. It was real. The FBI was infiltrating all the movement groups, even the so-called peaceful ones. And people were dying. I mean, you know, people were getting assassinated right and left. So we were very cautious. That's why there's hardly any pictures. Uh, in a way, we were part of the reason why you don't know a lot of people's names so I haven't heard of some somebody because I burned every photograph. I burned all my address lists, phone numbers, because we didn't want them to fall into, you know, the hands that are still out there. And believe me, they are out there. And yeah. so you have to be I paranoid about some of that. But on the other hand, you know, uh, you, you have to, the compa the, uh, I made plenty of mistakes. I, I misjudged a lot of people, you know, because you also have to have a certain degree of trust and, and welcome people. And so one of the things also, and to get back to, to you know, I, I, I have a lot of disagreements with Cesar Chavez, especially, you know, later in his life and what and the positions he took and, um, what happened, why the union, you know, fell from, I think, 50,000 at its peak to 6,000 members later. I mean, there's, that, that's, that's a pretty precipitous fall. <laughs> and there are reasons and we should learn from all of that in organizing. But again, you know, you don't, it's, I don't want to continue living in a black and white world where everybody has to, you know, this whole thing is, I think it's become even more exploited with the internet and stuff where people are so black and white, you're either all good or you're all bad, or this is all, you know, what, it's, it's just not like that. You know, you, you learn in life. I have plenty of friends, they, they some of them can't stand each other. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like a lot of things about them, but the thing is, is that I have a broad variety of friends I, because I've learned to listen to people and kind of take some of them <laughs> what they are. Now, I'm not going to change everything about them that they don't and that I don't like, just like I'm not going to be, and I don't want to change certain things they probably don't like about me. But there's some, you know, the thing about it, it it's not a cliche to say that it, you know, it's to look for the, the good in people and what they can do. And, you know, there's certain people also, I don't, I'm not of the kind in the movement. Some people are just like, oh, you know, it's all class. It's what class you were from. And I don't trust you. You're, you're from an upper class, bourgeois class, because people change. People do change. People have changed throughout history. And some of the best people I know are from, you know, very rich families, but they have a lot more what Holmes was talking about, the compassion and what they've done to help 
you know, move society forward than some really poor people I know. It's not just a matter of class, it's your consciousness. And this is what you're in college for. This is what education is supposed to be about. It's uplifting your consciousness, just like, you know, digging you down. It's all part of, of what, if you're not finding it where you are, then you have to start, you know, use the resources that you have to find out. I, I didn't know certain things. So that's just why I went, you know, certain things weren't happening. So I just said, well, nobody else is doing it. But, you know, it took me a while to do that. I listened to leaders. I was like, yeah, and inspired by, I want to, I used to go to rallies and I didn't know if there was a tough position, you know, about what, what, what should we, what position should we take about this matter or that matter? And sometimes I didn't know, but I, I waited for somebody that I, I admired to tell me what the correct position was. But after being involved in the movement for so long and trying to do things on my own and organizing, 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 I was able to finally get to a point where I didn't have to wait for some of you to tell me what the correct position to take was. I just kind of had to figure it out for myself because sometimes you don't have a choice. If somebody is falling off a ledge and you wait for somebody to tell you, what is the correct way for me to save this person? He's going to die. So you just go out there and you do the best you can to pull the person up. So that's just kind of like, you have to start using your brains and the more you use your brains, hey, voila, you know, you actually start stirring up stuff some more gray cells start to work better, you know? And you start thinking for yourself. Because don't believe everything I'm saying or Cesar Chavez is saying or Malcolm X is saying, you know? You have to learn how to sort out the good, what makes sense, what's right, what 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 you agree with and what, and then you can put the stuff aside. If overall, you know, to me, it, it, it's, it's we, we should honor, Cesar Chavez, he, he did a lot. He inspired a lot of people. He, he fought, he, he, he really did, you know, uh, take a huge step forward, his vision of that the, the, the lowliest, you know, worker could stand up and live in dignity and live, be able to put food on his table and not just better his own personal life, but to be, you know, uh, take his place in, in our society as a worthy, contributing human being. You know, that, that's not how farm workers were looked upon, you know, before this. Just that, and that's not how, you know, peasants, and most of us are peasants, you know, really. The majority of the people in the world, it's just like the people who talk about when they go back in time and they are reincarnated, somehow they always ended up being Cleopatra or the queen of, you know, France or something. <laughs> no, you're going to end up being a peasant because <laughs> most of us are peasants. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the point is that you, you just, I mean, uh, the point of change starts again within yourself. You, you, if you wait for society to change, if you wait for things to happen, better thing, you know, it's not, <laughs> that's the thing that you, you can start doing here, you know, just finding out the truth, digging the truth out, because that's, you know, it's, it's no crime to be, if you want to stay in academics, fine. I'm not for everybody going to the working class or going back to the fields or anything, because everybody has different skills and abilities. You can contribute just as much if you decide to stay in school and, and, and really become a true historian, you know? So you just have to figure those things out for yourself. But meantime, you know, you should be using this time here to do all these kind of things. I also, you know, used to, uh, became a late musician. <laughs> and I don't know if you read my bio, but I also was in a band and I took years out. I was traveling with, I toured with Rock Against Racism. You know, I never even considered myself being a singer <laughs> before, but because it meant something to me because I felt like I was giving a voice again to people who had not been seen, I could sing. I, I can't do just, silly stuff. I can sing it on my own, but it's not something I would take on the road because I don't feel, have any connection to it. But it's just things like that. If you find out you, you like to draw or whatever, I mean, that, that's with the other question I really that, like that I, and I don't think we had time to get into that Marcelo had on there about the role of art and music 
it, to me, it's hugely, it, it's just as vital as everything else. It's part of the earth. We've always had that. And we always, we have to keep paying, even if you can't sing a lick, that was what the group I helped organize the Mayfair Singers. We had people who couldn't carry a tune, but they were singing in it, right? And we actually had gigs all the time while we existed. So, because people wanted to hear those stories, I don't know if you read, but the thing about when we went to Santa Cruz and we sang to a group of mainly uh, Chicano uh, kids of farm workers. And they didn't want to have anything to do with us. They were mostly in gangs and they thought we were a square group of these Asians, you know, who looked ridiculous in these white shirts and black pants. I mean, we called ourselves the serendipity singers. <laughs> I mean, it was like a square folk deck, folk, folk song group. And, and they were, and the police were there and it was in this uh, gym in, in Santa Cruz. And, and they were all like, man, you know, what are these? And, and some of the our singers wanted to leave because they thought nobody's going to listen to us. So I said, hey, just, just keep singing, just keep singing. And so we start singing these songs. Oh, you know, it's not nice to block the, it's not nice to go to jail. <laughs> and it was just like, oh my God. And then suddenly we start thinking about, well, you know, mom had to work late at night in the fields and, and she's sewing and my, my dad never gets home. And I, mean, I don't, you know, how do you ever see my parents? And, you know, the songs were, I'm going to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. But, I mean, they were the first time that most people had heard, the, especially these kids, had heard anybody singing about their lives. And by the end of the show, we was just surrounded by all the kids. Time. How can we can we start? A, how did you guys start? Because this is what you this is. You know, just by doing that, and we, again, we were not really good singers either. <laughs> and the songs are corny as hell, but it struck a nerve. And just by doing that, you know, no matter how bad you, and you know, if you see a need and you, there's a hole and you can fill it with whatever talent you have, just go for it. I mean, what's the worst that's gonna happen, you know? So I'm sorry, <laughs> you see the time is almost up here. Sorry, my fellow. <laughs> It's all good, Vicky. You don't have to apologize for dropping science, as they say. Um, so yeah, we are right uh, at time. We're a little bit over time. So I apologize if we didn't get to any every question, but there's some awesome uh, reflections and, and a lot of gratitude and questions in the chat to check out. But I would be remiss uh, to not ask on this note of uh, cultural work, cultural resistance. Uh, I will just ask for even the sake of the posterity of the recording for us to close in the good by asking our relative Somos. Oh my God, my connection is bad again. Okay, I apologize. My connection is being funny. But all I'm saying is I just if we could borrow from the last few moments to ask Somos to uh, share with us uh, some of his uh, work. He's a super talented poet and lyricist. And uh, that is how I'd like us to close on that note. So uh, let's do that. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that, Marcelo. And thank you again, Professor Wong, uh, for everything. Uh, I'm, I was so tempted to fall, finish with the prayer of the farm worker movement, which is like the cla this classic poem that Cesar Chavez wrote is so moving and like it kind of is a declaration of sorts. So I, I kind of want to end with that, but you asked me to do some things that I wrote. Um, and I feel like I'm just, I'd rather end with his work. Well, shoot. I mean, you, you got me here, but what, what would you guys rather hear? Uh, wow, that's a hard choice, huh? Make, put it on your, your shoulders. All right. I'm just gonna, I'll just share my piece, okay? Um, this was this one's called Successful. And I would I would answer your question, Danielle. Uh, thank you, Bianca, I appreciate that. Um, uh, to answer your question, let's, let's help us all redefine what success means, okay? That's what we can do, I think. Because I think as a, as a teacher, I've learned that the criteria for what, you know, is considered success is very problematic. 
very unsustainable okay and is very counterproductive so um shoot the the prayer of the farm worker movement i don't have the link like handy but it's super simple to find if you were to even google cesar chavez prayer of the farm worker movement you would love it and i would i would ask you guys to read that with each other at some point marcelo and i'll, I'll talk to you guys about it in a second but this is my verse to a song i wrote called successful I was a red and black diaper baby, huelguista. Not comunista, but chavista, chiquitito, abuelito, had the guts to send his daughters on a bus, crossing the country to represent the hungry, us, the hardworking families fed up. Kids not fed enough, nope, but they wouldn't let up. Though paid five whole bucks each once a week to bring the struggle in the fields to them New York streets, Mexicanas with the chanclas on her feet. Mama organized so many hearts that nobody would eat California table grapes in 1968. Crate after crate spoiled as they traveled state to state, but still Reagan ate grapes on TV to spite them. Wrote laws to fight them, still mom kept organizing. Success looked like eight-hour workdays and drinking water, bathrooms and lunch breaks and housing with showers. It is the power I hold, my soul the vessel. Mom's life was stressful but mad successful. Rest, work hard, pay hard play hard, rest. I let my legacy define success. Thank you. Right on. Thank you all. So almost a gratitude to everybody here in the space, everybody who joined us from before. Thank you for uh, being generous with your time and your energy and your presence. Um, let us take this energy into our hearts, into our homes, into our work, into our families, our communities. I hope to see some folks tomorrow out uh, doing the work. And uh, every day, let's, uh, let's bring this, these messages and create our little reminders to remember this. So uh, on that, we're gonna have to, uh, we're gonna have to close and say thank you. So thank, uh, you. thank, thank you. you all so much. Thank you, thank you everyone. All right, take care of yourselves.